What's up? It's your boy, Jorrit. Sorry, I'll never do that again. Today, I would like to talk to you about delayed variable reward. And at the end of this video, I will show you something amazing. But first, uh, let me tell you about this stuff. Uh, I'm going to be talking about delayed variable reward specifically as it applies to my life as a strategy gamer. But I also just want to teach you about delayed variable reward variable rewards in general because these are a thing that exist in the world we know they exist we have studied them uh i want my viewing audience to understand what they are and have some idea of the consequences of their use and how they are used and how i feel about them uh as a strategy gamer what is a delayed variable reward well it's in the name uh, it's a reward it's something you want, but you get for doing something as a reward. It is delayed. So you don't get the reward straight away as you do the thing. Uh, you might not even know exactly when you will get it. Uh, possibly with some delayed variable rewards, you might actually never get them. Like um, if you're playing the lottery, for example, in theory, if you play the lottery long enough, you'll win a million dollars. Uh, but in actuality, like chances are pretty good you'll be dead before that ever happens. So uh, some sort of delay though. And then the reward is variable. Uh, you're not sure how much the reward actually will be. Uh, in a lot of games, the reward is sometimes like you lose. Um, so you like work out your strategy, you play your turn, and then you're hoping that what happens is it says, congratulations, you win. But then actually what happens is it says, oh no, you lose. Um, the fact that it's variable makes it feel better when you win and forgivable when you lose. If the game just always said you lose every time, it would be a very frustrating and unenjoyable game. But if it also always said you win every single time, it would also lack some of the compelling nature that games have. Uh, you want there to be a little bit of a struggle, you know? So delayed variable rewards are so engaging that there can actually be objectively negative expectation for a delayed variable reward and people will still pursue them. So say for example, that you are going to pay a dollar every week to have a chance of getting $5 uh, and there's a one in 10 chance of getting $5. If you do very basic math on that, you'll realize that your expectation per week is to lose 50 cents. But there are some people who find delayed variable rewards engaging enough that they will sign up for something like that anyway. Um, and when you have something like mentally compelling enough to make people just give money away, uh, you're going to see it start to be employed in like business settings where money is in play because companies want to take the money off the people who would like to give their money away. So you can see slot machines or the lottery as examples um, where delayed variable rewards are implemented by businesses or governments to take your money from you by offering you a delayed variable reward. Um, and I may step on some toes by saying this because if you are a person who gives money away to a billionaire, um, you probably have some justification for doing that that lets you sleep happily at night, right? Um, so people generally aren't cognizant or willing to accept that they're engaged by the delayed variable rewards, so instead they give strange justifications for what is actually engaging them when they're doing something like playing a slot machine. So they might say, I like the lights and noises on the slot machine. Like that might be what they're actually, you know, enjoying. It's not about the delayed variable reward, it's the lights and noises. It's just like fun to be in a bustling room full of noise, with like, you know, flashing lights and stuff. That's, you know, a lot of stimulus and stuff. That's enjoyable. It's okay that you're losing money on average to be in that room because you'd be willing to pay for that experience anyway. But if that's true, why not just go to a fucking arcade? Like you can just go to an arcade. It will cost you far, far, far less money. The games will be more fun. Uh, 
like, like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, or people will say that they buy a lotto ticket to keep the dream alive. They are thinking they might spike a million dollars this month on their lotto ticket, and that's worth it to them. You know, that feeling of hope. But, like, you can make high-variance investments that have positive expected return instead of negative expected return, or at least ones where you don't know for sure that it's negative expected return, right? Like, like it is possible to make a risky investment that could genuinely pay off. I don't know. Maybe you could, like, invest in your kid's college fund in the hopes that your kid goes to college, gets a great degree, and then is able to support you in your retirement, for example, or something like that. But that isn't the narrative you get. The narrative is about keeping the dream alive. And like, I really think there is a, like a terrible, heinous, harmful, like illogic going on uh, in the narratives that we're telling about these things when the things themselves viewed from the other side, right? People who build large structures full of slot machines are not thinking, I want my consumers to have an enjoyable and positive sensory experience. They're thinking, I want to trick my consumers and trap them in a maze full of slot machines so they will give me money for as long as possible. Um, People who are setting up lotteries are not thinking about how to keep the players of the lottery's dreams alive. They are thinking about how to raise money from the players of the lottery. So I, I just, I think this, this is like just a very logical thing. And I don't know. It's frustrating, kind of. Um... And there's a metaphor that I'm going to come to later in the presentation, which I'm actually just going to bring up right now. Um, it's, it's a little bit like understanding the germ theory of disease and trying to talk to somebody else about the importance of washing their hands or covering their mouth when they sneeze or something like that and having that person say something completely illogical and irrelevant to the germ theory of disease to explain why they're not going to do that. Um, like... I'm not going to cover my mouth when I sneeze. That's a sign of weakness or something like that. Which, like, you very, 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 very rarely hear someone ever say that because almost everybody, at least that I know, if someone said, like, I don't cover my mouth when I sneeze, it's a sign of weakness. If somebody said that, you'd be like, you're a fucking idiot. Cover your mouth when you sneeze. You're, like, going to make the people around you sick, and it's gross. <laughs> but when we're talking about delayed variable rewards... That isn't the attitude that people have. Someone will say, I regularly spend my money on the lottery in order to keep the dream alive. It's a fun time for me. And, and for what it's worth, I don't think that it's impossible that that is true. But what I do think is that our cultural conversation around the delayed variable reward that you're engaging with doesn't make sense and that if it made sense that would stop being true if our cultural conversation around the fact that you are making a negative expectation financial choice over and over again repeatedly was like gee you're like over the course of your life giving a lot of money away that's going to make it harder for you in retirement and harder for like the people who depend on you as well if that was our cultural conversation about this sort of behavior, I think probably far, far, far fewer people would think like, oh, the lottery ticket keeps the dream alive. Uh, I just don't think that your brain would make that connection ever. I think that your brain making that connection at all is pernicious and a uh, consequence of our failure to talk about these sorts of things the appropriate way. Um, so... Delayed variable rewards are all over gaming. Uh, by the way, my grandmother was an absolute slot machine addict. Um, she won a car playing slot machines and was still down to five figures overall when she died. And my grandfather on the other side of my family lost basically all of his retirement money um, 
making bad options trades on the stock market in retirement. He would just sit at his computer convinced that he could beat the stock market uh, and he couldn't. And uh, probably most of you can't either. And, and so like when I am talking about this shit, it is not like I have never been affected by it in any way. And I am speaking from a place removed with like heightened moral authority, blah, blah, like, like, no, I have seen people in my own life destroyed by this. Um, I also played poker for four years and spent a lot of time having other people tell me that I was destroying the lives of others by playing poker against them. Um, this is something that like I've very much lived and I've tried to talk to people in my family about this and had them push back at me and shit. So like, this is emotionally fraught for me a little bit, but hey, we're here. Uh, <laughs> delayed variable rewards are all over gaming. Um, so one of the things that f has frustrated me for a very long time about games is when people talk about how you can have a game of skill or a game of chance. And people will talk about games of skill like chess and people will differentiate heavily between a game like chess and a slot machine. The idea that chess and a slot machine could be compelling for comparable reasons I think would probably seem at first glance to be nonsensical to I would guess more than half of the people watching this video. But even in a game as logical, strategical, and um, non-stochastic, well, what would you call something that isn't random? Um, deterministic as chess? Like when you move the queen to a square on the board, you always know what the queen's going to do on that square of the board, right? Even in a game like this, a lot of the compelling nature of chess is that delayed variable rewards are compelling. And if you look at how chess works, um, when you play a move and then you're waiting for your opponent to play their move, that's basically you waiting for a delayed variable reward. You, you don't know how long you have to wait for them to make their move, so delayed, and, and it's a variable delay. You don't know if... Um, their move is going to be good or bad for you and your strategy. So the reward itself is variable. Sometimes it'll be good and sometimes it will be bad. And eventually you're hoping that their move will contain a mistake which allows you to brilliantly, in question marks, win the game. Perhaps. There's a, there's a very famous um, chess game in like 19 or something gold coin game let me get the proper Levitsky versus Marshall this is Marshall playing black Frank Marshall one of the famed chess players of the early 20th century black has a move here which is so brilliant that I have seen it referred to as the greatest chess move of all time the most brilliant chess move of all time Looking at the gold coin game Google search, there's a YouTube video here. It says the prettiest queen sacrifice of all time. I've kind of given it away by saying prettiest queen sacrifice, but honestly, the move is so impressive that even knowing you're meant to sacrifice your queen here, it's still a very um, challenging move for someone who's like a relative beginner to chess who hasn't seen the position before to find. Um, here, Frank Marshall played queen g3. And the story goes that he was showered in gold coins. And I think this is such a fascinating example of delayed variable reward because here we have presented what's happening as the Frank Marshall player playing black making this brilliant move through the powers of logic and what have you. And yet the context with it within which is presented. He's being showered in gold coins, literally like he's Mario who just jumped up to a block which gives you a random reward. <laughs> which is, like, at the time, Mario didn't exist, right? But now, sitting here and looking at it in the 21st century, it's it's really funny. And, and drawing the comparison between delayed variable rewards and chess moves, which I think is extremely warranted, um, it stands out to me. 
Uh, imagine being Frank Marshall and sitting in your chair and realizing that if your opponent played rook c5, which there was a chance your opponent would do, you would be able to play queen g3 and make the prettiest queen sacrifice ever played in chess. All the onlookers would be astounded by your brilliance. The board would be showered in gold coins. And imagine sitting there as Frank Marshall and waiting for your opponent to play their move and finding out whether you got to pull off your queen sacrifice or not. This is a delayed variable reward. Uh, if there was no luck in chess and two people played against each other, the same person would win every time. <laughs> uh, and even when computers play against each other in chess, which computer wins changes over time. Chess has luck in it in a variety of ways, and it has delayed variable rewards as well. And I think more importantly, because once you recognize that chess has delayed variable rewards, realizing, of course, that like slot machines are full of delayed variable rewards, and that can be very addictive to people and destructive to, to their lives, you can start recognizing like, oh, it's it's probably possible to like have a personality that feels addicted to delayed variable rewards and for playing chess to actually be very harmful for you, um, which is which is true. Uh, playing chess can be very harmful to people. There are people who get addicted to chess. There are people who, in Sasha Shapen's all the wrong moves, he describes himself so addicted to chess that he is holed up in his hotel room on travel, um, just playing blitz games for a week, and he is walking around his apartment to get away from his own stench. Like, he's he's staying in one place for a bit on his laptop. He smells really bad, so after a bit, he'll walk to the next place. Um, it's very possible to be addicted to games even if there's no monetary component involved in them, and even if there's no luck involved in them. Uh, delayed variable rewards are, of course, all over everything else, too. And once I've, once I've shown, like, okay, sure, slot machines. We get slot machines. I think probably most of us get slot machines, but also chess. <laughs> chess, that's weird. Uh, but once I've shown that, it's probably not too outrageous for me to point out um, other interfaces that we see and use throughout our daily lives are using delayed variable rewards to engage us as well. So social media platforms... Um, you don't have to pay to use Twitter or TikTok or whatever because they are making money from you using the site, which means that they have teams of people trying to work out how to get you to keep using the site, which means because humans are susceptible to delayed variable rewards, that unless they are very bad at their jobs, somebody at those companies is working out how to put delayed variable rewards into the platforms. Uh, it's not great. It's not a great state for the world to be in, but it is the state that the world is in. And so social media platforms, for example, will alert you that you've received notifications, but they don't tell you exactly what the notifications are. Creating a delayed variable reward. When you click into the application to see what the notification is, you're going to find out whether it's something that makes you happy or not. Uh, they also take variable amounts of time to load, which like on the one hand, probably it's hard to make a website that tons and tons of people use all the time, right? It's probably hard to make that website consistently load in the same amount of time, but I'm pretty sure it's also deliberate. Uh, or at least someone at the company is like, you shouldn't fix that. That's making people stay longer. Um, yeah, but social media platforms make money off of you browsing the platform because you'll see ads as you do. Uh, they also want lots of people to keep browsing their platform because they benefit from the network effect where if I choose to use a social media platform, I'm going to talk about it and then you're going to want to be on it too. And then both of us will be seeing ads on their platform. Uh, another one uh, is your, your cell phone. Your phone occasionally pushes notifications at you, promising variable rewards if you keep it on you throughout the day. What better example of a delayed variable reward could one come up with than an electronic device that sits in your pocket and occasionally buzzes with a reward for you. Uh, <laughs> it's just, just kind of the most straightforward thing imaginable. Phones are even at a point where like the rewards don't have any real relation to your actual life. Like the buzz is like, somebody followed you on TikTok. And it's like, you don't know that person. And TikTok 
is a business from China <laughs> and like your actual family members are perhaps in the room with you trying to have a conversation with you, but your phone is buzzing telling you to care about a person you don't know following you on a on a social media platform uh, run by a for-profit business from another country, uh, which is just kind of wild. But lay variable rewards are so sinister and so invasive into our psyches that, like, if somebody brings up the idea of banning TikTok, outrage. Outrage. Uh, which is wild. <laughs> it's, just, it's just wild. Uh, this is a this is a slightly less wild slide, but I like it still. Uh, I think it's really interesting to look at things which are fun in the world and see if they have delayed variable rewards in them, and then think about is there that thing without delayed variable rewards? Um, and so I I have a few examples. One is um, a jigsaw puzzle is basically putting together furniture with delayed variable rewards. When you put together the furniture. For me, I don't love it that much. I do not personally find it fun. Uh, you can find things fun for reasons other than delayed variable rewards, of course. I just don't personally enjoy putting together furniture that much. It's like kind of rewarding and it can be a nice workout sometimes. I usually feel pretty decent after I've done it, but like in the moment, it's not super great. But anyway, uh, when you put together furniture, you like have instructions and you go through them and you do the steps properly and then the furniture works. And there's not a whole lot of like What's it going to turn out to be? Will it be a bookshelf or a table? Like you probably know that already. Um, probably you purchased it, and if not, you can just like look at it and see. Probably. Uh, and also, there's not generally going to be a whole lot of like, does this piece fit together with that piece? Because um, the people who made the furniture item tried very hard to make sure that that was clearly communicated to whoever was having to put it together. But on the other hand, when you put together a jigsaw puzzle well the entire premise of the jigsaw puzzle is like you're not sure whether this piece will fit with that piece you have to do a whole lot of like scanning with your eyes looking for the corner pieces first so at first you're like filtering through all the pieces looking for like the corners and the edges and sorting by color and stuff so every time you pick up a piece it's like a little delayed variable reward you're like looking at it do i immediately recognize like which group of pieces this would go with is this an edge piece is it a corner piece etc like every single time you pick a... jigsaw puzzles are just like thousands of delayed variable rewards stacked on top of each other it is i used to do jigsaw puzzles as a kid and after like like a decade or more of being a person who made a living playing strategy games i went back and did a new one um uh like a month or two ago and it was kind of wild to me to do it and be like oh shit this is <laughs> this is it's kind of like a proto um video game almost in how heavily the fun in it is by like having lots of pieces and trying to find which ones fit together that's a lot a lot of what modern video strategy games end up being and why they are compelling um this is not necessarily a bad thing i think people should have fun and i think doing a jigsaw puzzle has redeeming value above what exists in a slot machine kind of um a like it is actually kind of mentally stimulating to try to work out like if i orient this piece this way it can fit with that or um, to think about, like, I want to separate these pieces into seven different groups because there seem to be seven different color profiles or something like that. Also, um, I want to say my mother absolutely loves was jigs, which are, that's a jigsaw backwards. Um, and they show you a picture of, like, the other side of the camera. So it's like you take a photo with the camera and that's what you're making a jigsaw puzzle of. But then also there's a photo of behind the camera um so you end up like having a photo of a bunch of people looking at something really weird and then the jigsaw you construct is like a a festival with a weird animal or something i don't know that's a bad example but um also a delayed variable reward <laughs> where you, you literally are not told exactly what jigsaw you're assembling right all right doing mental math <laughs> like six times seven 7 times 12, 8 times 21. 
Uh, I find that pretty boring. Um, but sometimes, like, I have actually sat at a restaurant and done long multiplication problems in my head to pass time before. I'm a weird guy. Uh, there is no escaping it. Uh, I could have not mentioned it, I guess, but that is not my current prerogative. <laughs> my current prerogative is to be transparent with you. Um, so I like doing mental math sometimes. Sure, it's like not awful. I used to do my times tables with my grandmother as a kid, and that was like relatively fun. She did a good job of making it fun, and that's probably a lot of why I enjoy mental math. Um, uh, if you if you add delayed variable reward to mental math, though, you get math riddles or maybe math problems, like uh, trying to prove a theorem or something like that. Because a lot of the difference between mental math and a math riddle is you're not exactly sure which mental math you're meant to do. And a lot of working out which mental math you are meant to do is like trial and error. And trial and error is very, very, very similar to delayed variable reward. Um, Implicit in trial and error is eventually you'll get trial and success, uh, which means that the reward for trial and error is variable. Sometimes it's error, but hopefully eventually it will be success, but you don't know how long it will be. You don't know how long the trial will go for, and it's going to take some time. That's implied in the trial part. Trial and error, a, a very close family member of delayed variable reward, and when you're using trial and error to try to solve a math riddle or something like that, you're probably getting a lot of the same mental stimulus that you get out of delayed variable rewards. Uh, pressing a button to give a billionaire one dollar doesn't seem like a very fun activity. Make it a slot machine. Suddenly, people will like actually get mad at me for suggesting that that's like a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> Jorbs, why don't you just let us have fun? I don't want you to give a billionaire a dollar. <laughs> I think our society is failing us. Um, I want to share just a lovely, lovely clip. I was thinking about this video this morning when I woke up and I was watching a Sudoku solving video. Sudoku are kind of like math puzzles and have a lot of the same trial and error sort of stuff going on, so have a decent amount of delayed variable reward in them. Uh, and I just thought this, this is from Is It Possible to Solve This? is the name of this YouTube video. So there's a delayed variable reward, although it tells you how long the video is. Um, here's Simon uh, trying to solve, trying to get the first number into Sudoku, like a variant Sudoku that he's been looking at for the last 28 minutes or something. And the same logic applies here. So this cage is an odd big total, i.e. 31 at least. And now, now, this is absolutely brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, I think. <laughs> and then he just sits silently thinking for like, for like 10 seconds. It's so wonderful. I, mean, I, it's, I love Simon very much. This is not intended to be a uh, flack at Simon in any way. I, I absolutely love his videos. And I don't think he's like doing this deliberately to try to over act and make it seem more exciting for the viewers than it actually is. I think this is genuinely what it's like to solve a very complex Sudoku and that he is presenting it to an audience in an engaging way. But it was really funny to me waking up thinking about this video and then watching him like trying to work out the Sudoku. And he went back and forth actually for like three or four minutes being like, oh, I think I have it. That's so good. Wait, do I have it? Uh, it's like a a little delayed variable reward um, clip. There's got to be a, a more a more beautiful word than clip, like a little art piece. So anyway, uh, we've talked a bit about what delayed variable rewards are. By the way, like the science of it, I have heard is that uh, like when humans were hunting or trying to fend off predators in prehistoric times. It was very important for them to be engaged in the moment and to think about those sorts of things a lot. And so our brains are very intently attached to situations where we're not sure what's going to happen next. Um, 
but I don't know. It's like pop psychology. It feels like pop psychology is a field where like there's just almost zero percent chance that anything we think is right. Uh, so, so that's my opinion of pop psychology. Um, maybe psychology in general. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but regardless of exactly why these exist in our brains, they, they do exist, I think we can safely say, at least for some people. Some people are very attached to delayed variable rewards. Maybe not everybody is. Different people have brains that work in different ways, right? So uh, something might work for you one way and somebody else a different way. And that's something that I try to be very cognizant of when I'm thinking about how delayed variable rewards work for me. Um, but also I do think that, like, even if a delayed variable reward is fun for you, we got to work out how to build a world where you can get that fun without giving a billionaire another $10,000 this year playing slot machines. I, I just think, I just think it shouldn't be that, it shouldn't be out of reach for us to try to have that goal. At least have it as like a stated goal, right? So you can you can say to me, like, that's not a reasonable goal. We will never succeed at it. Great. I don't really give a fuck. I want the statement, like, it would be nice if that were true to be, to be a statement that we, we are all saying. Um, let the people who are in charge of doing it work out how to do it. But if, if the people who aren't in charge of doing it could like stop saying it can't be done and just say like it would be nice if it were done although i don't personally know how to do it that would vibe with me personally anyway anyway um uh having said all of this stuff i don't even think delayed variable rewards are like like morally bad or necessarily evil i think they're just a tool um with which something can be designed they are a type of thing that certain people react to in certain ways, and knowing that you can use them when creating media or creating an interface or creating a product, so on and so forth. And depending on what you're actually achieving with what you're doing with them, that could end up being a good thing or a bad thing. So for example, uh, I think that when they're used to make a fun jigsaw puzzle, that's pretty cool. I enjoy a jigsaw puzzle on occasion. It turns out also jigsaw puzzles are kind of like a nice social activity where you can do them with other people and you can start to have like a conversation community around them. So it's nice to have this like engagement tool of it's fun to look for the pieces which fit in the right spaces going. I also find that with jigsaw puzzles, you like see how people have brains that respond differently to different things in a way that has so much less judgment than something like a casino. <laughs> Um, if I'm doing a jigsaw puzzle and someone else is like, oh, I get really into this. Can I play with you? And then another person is like, I'm not really super into jigsaw puzzles. Uh, I have never personally seen that end up in like name calling. Whereas for some reason, if somebody is like, I don't really like playing slot machines, I'd rather not, um, that gets attached to heightened emotions, uh, which like fuck right uh anyway uh i think there are some ways in which delayed variable rewards can be used as a tool um which is good but i'm going to talk about gaming more specifically now and for most of the rest of the video um they can also be used in ways which are bad so in gaming we see delayed variable rewards uh often used with microtransactions if somebody at a company is like, we could make money by offering people purchases while they're playing the game. Probably the person at that company who worked that out has read some research about human psychology and like sort of like in the same book as you read about the microtransactions for in-game purchases, they're going to also read about delayed variable rewards and they're gonna be like, and instead of them buying Cristiano Ronaldo so they can play with him in FIFA Ultimate Team, they can buy packs which might have Cristiano Ronaldo in them. And then we've created a delayed variable reward system where if you buy enough packs, you should get that Cristiano Ronaldo card that you really want for your FIFA Ultimate Team, but you don't know exactly how long it will be 
And then every time you buy a pack, you'll get some other cards, and some of them might be good, some of them might be great, uh, or they might be bad, but there's your variable reward. And yeah, um, there you go. You have created an addictive gameplay loop that has no underlying challenge or enjoyment. Um, playing FIFA uh, and like playing the actual video game is fun. It's cool. Uh, it itself has a lot of delayed variable rewards in it, like um, does your cross reach the player you were targeting with it and so on and so forth. But, you know, there's a decent soccer-esque game down there somewhere which you can engage with and enjoy. I very much truly believe that. Um, and there are skills you can develop to get better at that game in ways that are rewarding, cool, awesome. It can be a really fun game to play by yourself or with friends. All great this ultimate team thing, though, where you are opening packs trying to get Cristiano Ronaldo, like, wow. <laughs> wow. I, I just think maybe the book, which is like you can offer in-game purchases and you can make them like slot machines for your game for children, maybe that book should be sold with, like, Ethics 101 as, uh, as accompanying material. <laughs> um and and then if they were sold together, we could start talking about um, putting the people who do it anyway in jail, because <laughs> I think you should go to jail for doing this. Uh, I think that like, I think we have more evidence that this is hurtful to consumers than we do that like, than we did that smoking cigarettes was hurtful for consumers when we got like all the nicotine executives i don't even know what happened to them honestly what happened to cigarette company ceos uh, in april 1994 seven top tobacco ceos april 1994 that late i thought it was like the 60s that they didn't believe nicotine was addictive. Two years later, they were all under federal investigation for potentially lying under oath and no longer leading their embattled cigarette companies. I mean, okay, did they, like, get guillotined, though? Like, how many people did they kill? We have... We're not good at legislating against things which are addictive. It's... I think it's very hard to do because the people who are addicted to them really like them, Right? And then there are some people who, like, actually don't really have addictive personalities about them at all, who don't get addicted to them, and they're probably like, well, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal to me. The, the Venn diagram of, like, people who aren't chemically dependent on this thing, but they do care about this thing, isn't that large? I guess for cigarettes, there's a lot of, like, my husband died of lung cancer. That's probably, you know, gonna do a thing. I notice a lot with parents these days, like parents of young children who I'm starting to know more and more parents of young children as I um, age through my 30s. Uh, a lot of parents of young children are like, I don't know how to get my kid to stop looking at their iPad screen. <laughs> um, or they're using the like screen as something to help them raise their kid like this is a fun activity it's okay for you to do for a couple of hours a day or something like that but then when their kid starts doing the ipad screen thing you like you like look at the kid and and the kid's dad looks at the kid and you look at each other and you're like that that kid looks like a zombie like like the expression is gone from their face they're not like visibly reacting to what's happening anymore there's just like lights being played at them from the screen so 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 i guess what i'm trying to say is like maybe parents of kids who have um run up ten thousand dollar credit card bills without uh asking permission first are are going to make a hubbub with congress and uh this will get banned i don't know i don't know maybe it will happen but like some of this stuff is awful <laughs> some of the stuff is just transparently awful um I should talk about myself a bit more here before I introduce ways which I think delayed variable rewards can be good. Um, because my relationship with delayed variable rewards is very weird. Um, 
I played three and a half million hands of Nomad Hold'em over the course of four years. I was generally playing 16 to 24 games of Nomad Hold'em at the same time. This was from 2008 to 2011. I made some number of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, it was nice. I got to travel through most of my 20s. I got to live off savings. Uh, eventually that money like dwindled and I got a job again. Uh, welcome back to reality. But um, that was a good four years of my life. I stopped playing poker on April 15th of 2011 because the U.S. government shut the sites I was playing on down um, for a variety of reasons. I think the main reason being that they wanted to be able to tax people who were playing poker. <laughs> Uh, they wanted the people who were really into delayed variable rewards, which is like what you get a lot of in poker, to be in brick and mortar casinos where uh, American business owners could be uh, taking advantage of them. Is that the right verbiage? I don't know. Um, or to perhaps be using sports betting sites, which were in the U.S. So that, that money stayed in the U.S., I'm noticing increasingly uh, here in the 2020s that sports betting seems to be on the rise in the U.S. and like a little uncomfortable. Um, I'm quite used to clicking a button which could lose me or win me a thousand dollars. That's something I did many, 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 many times in my career as an Olympic Hold'em player, uh, and then not even bothering to watch what happens afterwards. I was playing 20 tables, and I was done with all of the decisions for that hand. What is the point of me sitting and watching it? Uh, whether I win or lose the thousand dollars doesn't matter that much to me right now. It doesn't affect any further decisions that I have to make today. And so generally I would like click all in, go to next table. The hand I clicked all in and on is done. I don't care anymore. Um, exceptions for when I like wanted information on the player that I was playing the hand against, then I was like curious which cards they had. Um, but yeah, I, I very often would engage with what's meant to be a delayed variable reward, but I don't care. <laughs> um, and in general, I find delayed variable rewards quite boring and sometimes straight up repulsive. They are not naturally compelling to me. I find them frustrating. I work in an industry where social media usage is essentially mandatory and have struggled immensely to care even a little bit about stuff like TikTok. I managed to, like I started on YouTube. So YouTube and my, sure, we go way back, um, but I do not look at my YouTube metrics like almost at all. As a content creator, like, like even like your metrics are presented to you like a delayed variable reward. It's all wild. It's all wild. Um, cause I'm one of, I'm one of the people who makes them money. So they are trying to create an experience of using YouTube, which will make me keep doing it. It's, <laughs> it's, I don't love it. Uh, the same is true on Twitch. Like they'll, they'll give you numbers that can make you happy or sad. And they'll give you to you at slightly unpredictable times and they'll display them to you in ways which imply that they should be the focus of your attention when they're not actually important at all to what you're trying to do. Like my, my job on Twitch is to run a broadcast for my audience where I am playing a game and chatting with them. And like, there is just no reason whatsoever for me to need to know what my current follower number is, but it is displayed prominently in their interface. And, uh, my my viewers like i don't need to know what my concurrent viewers are but that is displayed incredibly prominently in the interface um and sometimes like will visibly go up and down <laughs> uh, so so i just do not like any of that shit um i don't like it i managed to get onto twitter at the start of the pandemic um i was bored and twitter provided some like social uh rewards for me so i got on but yeah not a fan of all that shit in content creation not a fan of it in games not a fan of it in the rest of my life do not like delayed variable rewards very much i find them boring and if i get 
in some situation where I'm finding them compelling, I generally find myself like kind of hating myself and feeling gross after like an hour or two of that experience. Um, and what I do like, on the other hand, is thinking about decisions and how to make the best one. And that's why I'm a strategy gamer. Uh, we have spent such a long time talking about delayed variable rewards and how they're everywhere that perhaps it's starting to seem like there's nothing else in the world. But there are so many other things in the world. There are hanging out with friends. There are interacting with complex systems and trying to understand them. There's learning. There's testing yourself. Maybe that's a delayed variable reward. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but there's a lot more to life. And what I personally like about strategy games is that they become a mutually understood language with which you can connect with other people about some complex problem. And so it's really fun for me to sit down at a game like Slay the Spire and be like, I need to work out the best strategy for getting up the spire with the silent. These are the cards. These are the relics. They're the same for everybody. I can talk about them. I can say, like, I've been having success with this thing. You can do this and this and this with it. And other people will hear what I say and be able to understand that and relate to it and use it in their own games and then respond to me with their own things. That's great. Love that in strategy games. Sometimes strategy games fail at that for other reasons, like toxicity in communities and stuff like that. But in general, that's what I'm here for. And... So the nature of strategy games to have delayed variable rewards in them is something that I am willing to work with and largely like overlook. Like I don't really need the delayed variable rewards in my strategy games. Um, but there's this interesting thing where I think a lot of my audience does like the delayed variable rewards. Uh, and so, like, if I play, like, a story game or a an incremental game, perhaps, there, there are games which don't have delayed variable rewards. Like, the rewards are clear and understood ahead of time, or, or you're just playing a story game, which, like, doesn't really set up a risk-reward framework at all. You're just learning something new. I definitely noticed that a lot of the people who watch this channel will tune out even though the sorts of things that I like are still there. The things that I like are like, oh, this story is complex and compelling and it's creating a shared language. It's a shared experience that me and the other people who consume the story can connect on and analyze together and reflect on together. It's very, very similar to why I like strategy games or incremental games. An incremental game is like universal paper clips almost. Um, where you're just like, you click a button and you make one of the thing, and then eventually you'll like buy a generator, which makes one of that thing for you automatically every second, and then you'll buy a different generator, which makes one of the first generator for you. And as you go through, you'll like do a lot of like maximizing and trying to work out, okay, which like which order should I buy the different generators in? I have this rate of income, should I buy that thing or that thing first? It's a strategy game, but it doesn't have delayed variable rewards. Um the like everything's calculable and understandable and you can spend time doing that if you want. And I find those very fun as well. But generally the excitement about a new game on my channel is often about a game which does feature delayed variable rewards. And often the games which I see the most excitement about are the games which most prominently feature delayed variable rewards. Not always, but sometimes. So, the best case for me in a strategy game is, like, sure, you can have your delayed variable rewards. When I win the fight, you can give me a reward of three different cards, and they can be random. That's fine. You can give me a random amount of gold. You can give me a potion sometimes and not give me a potion other times. That's all fine. Do that. Okay. But uh, I find that the best strategy games stack many different delayed variable rewards on top of each other. So if I get unlucky with one, that's not the end of the game. There's still lots of other chances to find something that I can use to win. And I want to reach a point where I'm learning complex systems in order to master variants and consistently win. Instead of feeling like 
whether I win or lose is based on a die roll. I don't want that. What I want is to think like there are a hundred chances for me to win every run. And all I need is for one of them to come together. And I have learned that I can pretty consistently win this way. So if I see an option to do that, I can go for that and I'll probably win. Or I've learned that this thing and this thing put together uh, become very powerful and increase my odds for the rest of the run. So if I see that thing and that thing, I'll put them together and increase my odds for the rest of the run. Those are the connections that I like to make. And then whether I win or not doesn't really matter that much. So for me, the delayed variable rewards are, are being blunted because like, if I lose, that's okay. Uh, lose equals learn. <laughs> I think is I think that's a thing from Teamfight Tactics or maybe League of Legends or something. Lose equals learn. You have five wins today and five learns. <laughs> anyway, um, so it feels very extremely rewarding, very extremely rewarding for me to win a game like Scythe Aspire because I'm conquering the delayed variable rewards. I'm getting to a point where they are insignificant in the face of my strategy. I have realized that like almost always I will have some sort of opportunity to put together perhaps a good way to draw cards and a good way to generate energy. And when I have both of those things in my deck, the deck becomes very powerful because it can play lots of cards in a turn. And by learning that, I've gotten to a point where I can win the game a large percentage of the time, regardless of what the rewards are. Uh, most of the time, they're going to be good enough that I can utilize them for this strategy I'm using. But the focal point for me is the strategy, the strategy that I worked out in its execution and thinking about how it interfaces with the other things in the game. And the delayed variable rewards are just kind of like checkpoints to whether I can employ that strategy or not. And sometimes it can be really fun because if that strategy doesn't come together, I go for a different strategy instead. So the rewards kind of can stop feeling variable a little bit and just start feeling different, which is what variable means. But what, but what I mean is um, where the delayed variable rewards used to be like you lose versus you win $100 on the slot machine. Now the delayed variable reward becomes like you should build a poison deck this run versus you should build a discard deck this run. And neither of those actually like end the run for me or take me out of playing the run or anything. And I don't even have a preference for one over the other. They're both fine. The delayed variable reward is just kind of guiding my strategy through the run. And that is the way that I am interfacing with and the way that I'm finding it very enjoyable to play. So my gameplay isn't spent watching the delayed variable rewards. It's not about opening the card pack and seeing which card I'm going to get. That isn't exciting for me. It's meant on improving what they will be as much as I possibly can. And I should also say like using what I get as well as I possibly can as well. The actual result is mostly irrelevant to me in the end. Um, yeah. This is like also somewhat why I burned out on things like going for win streaks really hard in games. There are other reasons too, but like one of them is you, you place importance on whether the result of the run is a win or a loss. And that is not something that is always under your control in a strategy game. And I find it a lot more enjoyable to place importance on things which are under my control in a strategy game, like how I'm going to use the cards get up, that get offered to me, for example. It doesn't matter if they lose. I just want to try to use them as well as I possibly can. And I want to think about how to do that and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have... Three examples of strategy games which I think have done a great job of having delayed variable rewards on them. Here's FTL. I just had a fight against an enemy ship. The enemy ship was variable. Uh, I didn't know before the fight what, exactly what it was going to be. Uh, in the fight, I fired a lot of missiles at it, and they fired missiles at me, and that was all variable too. Missiles are a consumable resource, so... I chose to spend some, but didn't necessarily have to. I could have chosen a different tree of delayed variable rewards in which I just used my burst laser instead of using my missile if I thought that that was better. It took some amount of damage in the fight, which stays on my vessel. So the damage that I took from them mattered. It was important to the rest of the run and relevant to my strategy. 
uh, and I'm getting rewards, and the rewards are variable. I am choosing between some randomly generated rewards, or I could even choose not to accept their surrender, finish destroying their vessel, and then I'd get different rewards. So that feels a very, very, very good game. It has some flaws. Um, I think one of its biggest flaws is that you have this time after the fight where you repair your ship. And that means that a lot of the damage that your ship takes during fights doesn't matter because you'll just repair it before the next fight anyway. The hull damage sticks around. Um, that doesn't repair between fights. Uh, you can repair it other ways, but it doesn't generally repair between fights. But like you can go repair your oxygen room before you have to fight the next ship, which means it doesn't really matter that much in the site that my oxygen room was destroyed because once the fight is over, I can just go repair it. I find it a bit more fun when damage dealt to you during a fight sticks around. Although, like, slinking about Slay the Spire, I wouldn't really like it if all the slime stayed in my deck after I fought Slime Boss. So, I don't know. Maybe that isn't actually true. Example 2, XCOM. Video media. This is a 100% shot on XCOM, which misses. Uh, that That's a, like, very succinct delayed variable reward, though. Uh... Here you go. The game is telling you the chance that it will work. You press the OK button. It either works or doesn't. It is a delayed variable reward in, I would say, like a pretty bad way because it's forcing you to watch this action happen. Um, it's basically forcing you to spend time engaging with something other than the strategy of the game because you're just watching the delayed variable reward and seeing whether it happens or not. I don't think that this is a great part of XCOM, the part where you click OK and then watch your soldier shoot. Um, but I, I do like a lot of other things about XCOM where you are positioning your soldiers to try to make that 100% chance to hit higher. You can see there are lots of buttons on this interface because there are lots of different options that I have with what I'm going to do with my soldier this turn. The interface is pretty clear about what my chance to hit and what my critical chance is. and uh, at least in the types of XCOM that I play, that is true information, which isn't lying to me. And I can also click more info to get more info. Like if I flanked the enemy instead of shooting it through cover, I would have a higher chance to crit or something like that. Um, so that's all cool. XCOM is generally pretty good at being a game full of delayed variable rewards, but still allowing you to focus primarily on the strategy that you are using and eventually get to a point where the delayed variable rewards do not feel like they can take you away from the strategy game. Slay the Spire. Uh, I have played over 9,000 hours of Slay the Spire. I have a 1,400 run video playlist or something, maybe even longer than that, on this YouTube channel. Uh, this is a game that I have played very, very, very many runs of. And I chose a screenshot from my floor per day run, which is a run where I only let myself um, go to the next floor if I have spent at least an hour on the current floor. So uh, Slay the Spire run has 57 floors in it. Usually I'd be done with it in an hour and a half, but this run, uh, the, the conceit is that I'm committed for 57 hours if I'm going to win it, and I have to find something to analyze in Slay the Spire in order to do that. I thought this was a good run to give as an example because... To me, it's kind of emblematic of my general point, which is that delayed variable rewards can exist in strategy games, but the thing that I personally want to engage with and find interesting is developing my strategy for how to play them. And so Slay the Spire has tons of delayed variable rewards. I don't know what hand I will draw next turn. I don't know which cards the enemy will give me at the end of the fight. I don't necessarily know whether the enemy will attack me or not next turn, depending on which enemy it is. I don't know which enemy I'll fight as I go into the floor. I don't know when I go to a question mark what sort of event it will be, or whether it will be a shop or a treasure or just another enemy fight. I don't know any of these things. However, I slay the spire, I am able to focus on the strategy. Regardless of that, I'm able to think about which things I get and how to use them to win the run. And in my floor per day run, I'm like just doing that for an hour, basically. Uh, and I'm like spending an hour thinking and then having relatively few delayed variable rewards per floor. So I'm only getting like three of them per hour or something like that. I saw a really interesting um, a really interesting analysis of all the different 
seasons of The Simpsons where someone went through and counted how many jokes there were per minute in The Simpsons and said that like a problem with modern Simpsons was that there were more jokes per second. So The Simpsons was more and more about jokes and less and less about the things you could fill the show with other than jokes, like developing the characters or sending some sort of constructive message to the audience um, or, I don't know, making something heartfelt. And that, that was a really fascinating video to me. It made me think a lot about how the world is moving towards short-form content and how the world is moving towards like certain types of metrics and, and thinking that something is more engaging than some other thing. Um, but like often when I look at the world like that, I'm kind of reminded of my first ever run of Slay the Spire where I was offered Perfected Strike and it said it deals more damage if you have more Perfected Strikes in your deck. And so I was like, oh, I get it. I'll just build a deck with Perfected Strikes and I'll put more Strikes in it and this will be great. And I died in Act 2 when I fought against an enemy that had more than 60 health and it just attacked me and I didn't have any block cards and I died. And I lost my run of Slay the Spire. When I look at the world, I often feel like someone has found a card like Perfected Strike and is trying to just put Perfected Strikes into everything, more and more and more and more of them, and just isn't very good at Slay the Spire. Um, and so the thing that is being constructed is successfully maximizing how many Perfected Strikes it is, but it isn't a good deck or TV show or social media platform or community website or what have you it isn't a business that's serving its customers as well as possible so on and so forth this is a thing that i i commonly feel when i look at the world and so playing Slay the spire in a way which reduced how many delayed variable rewards i had per hour kind of was striking to me uh it it felt really fun actually and it was kind of relaxing and my brain had space to wander and start to think about different things, which was really remarkable to me. Um, so that is, that is my detour around Slay the Spire and my floor per day runs. Now, sometimes games have delayed variable rewards and they fall flat for me. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, th this uh, absolute nonsense with trying to open Cristiano Ronaldo. You gross repulsive. But also sometimes games are just kind of tedious and boring. And it's not that they're repulsive, it's just like I don't find this fun. Um so some things that make games just kind of tedious and not very much fun for me, uh, when they have delayed variable rewards in them are if it's very hard to like learn about the delayed variable rewards and how to manipulate them, so if the mechanics of the game are hidden or unreliable, I would like to be able to conquer them, and, and that's why I'm okay with them existing to begin with. The, the reason that I'm okay with them being there is because it feels good to get over the hill and not have to deal with them anymore because I've just surpassed them in skill level to a point where I don't feel like they matter very much. Uh, if the game hides ways for me to do that from me such that I'm kind of always stuck with them, that can be really dissatisfying and make me not want to play a game anymore. Uh, another thing is if the delayed variable rewards actually exist outside of the gameplay. So they aren't actually in the gameplay, and the XCOM shot is actually a pretty good example of this. Um. This delayed variable reward, is it an example? Mm, I've changed my mind. It isn't a good example of this. We'll get to a good example of it next slide. Um, but basically, the idea is like, okay, so I'm playing, say, chess or whatever, and chess has a bunch of strategies and stuff, and I'm playing it against other people on my skill level, and we're playing games. Eventually, I will find the point of my sentence, eventually. Um, if at the end of my game of chess, uh, my ELO rating changed and it went up and down by some amount, which by the way is a delay vari delayed variable reward, uh, that would be fine. 
But if the interface randomly decided not to show me that sometimes, I would just find that really confusing and bizarre. Like if you're on chess.com and you played a game of chess and you won and the interface was like, your elo has changed, but we won't tell you how much by this time. Play another four games to find out. I'd be like, no, fuck you. <laughs> um, it's fine for the delayed variable rewards to be within the gameplay, but if they start to be placed around the gameplay, it's very distracting and detracting from the game for me. Microtransactions in a game is another example, I guess, where I have already explained many reasons why I vehemently hate microtransactions. But another thing is that opening Cristiano Ronaldo in a pack isn't actually a part of playing the game. The, the game is like controlling your soccer players on the field and passing to each other and taking shots and things like that. There's this entire other element of FIFA, which is pack opening, where you go into a completely different window and you click on the packs and open them and stuff. And that, for me to be okay with that, it would have to exist as its own game where there was strategy within it for me to play it and conquer it. Like it would need to be its own strategy game. Since it's going to be a different thing, I need it to be a different thing, which is a good game for me to think it's a good game. You can't like attach that to the soccer game and be like, see, this part's here too. And you like the entire game overall, right? So you must like this part too. Like, no, I fucking don't. I hate it. I take it, get it out. Gone. Gone. My transactions were the imposter. Shoot them into the lava. Uh, and, and then third bullet here that I thought of is that they aren't actually delayed variable rewards, but I have to do tedious math to work out what they really are. A recent pet peeve of mine. It is so frustrating when, when like a game pretends that what's going to happen is random and then presents it happening as exciting. And first off, it happening shouldn't be what's exciting about the game to begin with for reasons we've already discussed. But sometimes what happens isn't even random, like you already know what's going to happen. Sometimes in strategy games, which are generally good, things will break down in this sort of way. Like um, you'll reach a point where you very, very, very clearly uh, won some sort of game but the game's music will still be blaring and it will still be like zooming in on the final shot that your soldier takes or whatever and you're like this doesn't really matter there are 15 other soldiers who can just shoot it if i miss it just doesn't matter whether like you don't need the music it's okay chill out um sometimes things can break down in that way a little bit but recently I've been playing Bellatro on stream a little bit because a lot of people have told me that Bellatro is a really good game and the game is literally telling you what your reward will be if you take a certain action. It's like, here's how many points you'll get, here's how much they'll be multiplied by, but then it won't tell you what the answer to that many points times that much multiplier is and then you sit and watch it do it and it presents it like it's a slot machine, but it's mental, but... This is, this is such bad gameplay that it like actually makes me want to go live in the mountains and never install a game again. Like that isn't gameplay. This is an animated calculator. The game already knows what the score is going to end up being. It, it, it already knows. You don't need... You don't need... By the way, this entire sequence is like 30 seconds long or something. I just clipped seven seconds of it, um, but, it but it's much longer and it starts out slower. Um, that is intensely, intensely upsetting for me that that exists. <laughs> um, and, but sometimes people who like delayed variable rewards like watching my channel because it's fun to see me overcome them. That is a thing that I believe. Um, some people who like playing Slay the Spire is kind of a brain-off game and it's just fun to see whether you can get eight claws or not. Cool. 
they'll watch me and they're like, oh, it's really fun. He's playing that game that I like where you can get eight calls sometimes uh, and he's doing like all the thinking for me so I don't have to do the thinking. I can just watch him do it. That's cool. Um, and maybe that isn't all of my audience or, or something, but, but I do think that it's some of my audience. Um, yeah. And, you know, that is cool for you. Um, but often games full of variable, delayed variable rewards are actually pretty bad games. <laughs> uh, and... And if all you care about is that the game has delayed variable rewards and that's like the extent of your engagement with the game, then you and I are not going to have very compelling discussions about strategy games together because I just don't care about the delayed variable rewards. I wish they would go away. I want to interact with the complex system and try to problem solve and develop strategies to get good at these games. Um, it's fine to enjoy strategy games for different reasons than me. And I suppose it is kind of fine to build a thing. No, no, it's it's fucking awful. Uh, <laughs> time to gatekeep a tiny bit to end the presentation. Um, I I do genuinely think delayed variable rewards are dangerous, and that they are being used by companies to deliberately harm consumers. Uh, and by that, I mean like addict consumers to their interfaces and perhaps their products and take money from their consumers that their consumers are not being well spent, well served in spending on, on those things. Uh, I, I genuinely think that about the world and I think it is important for us to be able to name delayed variable rewards when we see them and understand what they mean. Uh, and and that's kind of the entire hope that I had in presenting this video was like, I would like to talk about the later variable rewards on my stream sometimes. And so I wanted to make a video where I talked about what they were for you. Um, I personally try quite hard to minimize the importance of delayed variable rewards in my own life. If I have the ability to turn something like that off in the game I'm playing or on an interface that I'm using, I will. I have my phone silenced. It is not allowed to make any noise. I look at it very rarely. Um, I try not to use social media more than I have to, although sometimes I fail because delayed variable rewards claw at your brain and try to addict you. And at some point in the pandemic, uh, a company successfully inserted its own delayed variable rewards into the way that I socialized with other human beings. And, well, fuck them. Um, but that is kind of the world that I live in a little bit now. Uh, I have increasingly been interacting with humans in ways outside of social media, again, as the world has opened up, and that has been lovely and very good for mental health. And, you know, I recommend that you probably do all of this stuff too. I think you will be well served in like silencing your phone unless your parents ring or you know somebody important to your life is trying to get in touch with you stuff like that i think that's pretty important um i don't think that you should set an expectation that you can be texted at any moment of the day and you will respond straight away because implicit in having that expectation on yourself is the idea that every moment of your life is waiting for a delayed variable reward where you receive some sort of communication from somebody you love. Uh, and that, I think, is not super healthy, especially when it's attached to a small electronic device that's in your pocket. I think probably it's a better idea to like have your phone silenced and check it every few hours. Um, and that's what I personally try to do. Uh, I know that that's not normal. I also know that I have spent probably a lot more of my life engaged with and thinking about the consequences of delayed variable rewards than most people have. And so I don't think that I've come to this conclusion lightly or erroneously. I, I, I just think it's probably a pretty good idea to try out that behavior for yourself. I think the most forceful version of this sort of statement that I am going to make I was thinking about it a little bit because going all the way back to like the slot machine thing, like I have had people get very mad at me for telling them 
that I think that their behavior is not serving them well. Um, people don't really like it if you tell them that, right? Like, um, but stepping away from it, it's like, there is a thing we know addicts lots of people, which companies purposefully use to manipulate people. Um, and I'm noticing that you are doing a thing that exists because of that. I do feel like the logical conclusion kind of follows, but it, it's, it's just very hard to ever tell somebody that, uh, yeah, it's tough. But, but anyway, I think the most forceful version of the statement that I would make is probably that I think that filling your life with delayed variable rewards in 2024, with how much we know about the world and how they work and how they are used in 2024, is a little like not washing your hands. We know about germs. Um, uh, we also know about delayed variable rewards. And I hope that you know a little bit more about them now. And I hope that in the same way that you wash your hands because you don't want to get sick, you pay attention to delayed variable rewards because you don't want, you know, some billion dollar company to addict you to a product that isn't actually bringing you any happiness or value. This has been your boy Jorbs. Oh, and I said that I was going to do something with It Would Amaze You at the end of the video, um, which I am going to do, but I'm never going to tell you what it is because I'm going to stop recording. So uh, I guess it would have amazed you, but that was, that was me trolling you a little bit. See, it's a delayed variable reward, but uh, 